Hey, good afternoon. Can I remind members that COVID measures are in place and that face masks should be worn while moving around the Chamber and the wider Holyrood campus? The next item of business is portfolio questions. Uh, and the portfolio this afternoon is Rural Affairs and Islands. If a member wishes to ask a question, to press a request uh, in the uh, well, press the request to speak buttons or put an R in the chat function during the relevant questions. There's quite a bit of interest in questions throughout uh, this session. So again, the usual plea of uh, succinct questions and uh, answers to match. Uh, and I call question number one from Maurice Golden. Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to promote the welfare of dogs. Cabinet Secretary. We have taken a number of significant steps over the past few years to promote the welfare of dogs, including the introduction of new animal licensing regulations, stronger maximum penalties for the most serious animal welfare offences and Finns law to provide additional protection for police dogs. Now, following the granting of legislative consent for the relevant parts of the UK Kept Animals Bill, we continue to work with other administrations on proposals to restrict the number of puppies that can be imported in one vehicle and to prevent the importation of puppies aged less than six months, heavily pregnant females or dogs that have had their ears cropped are subject to other mutilations that would be illegal in the UK. We also have a programme for government commitment to consult on extending licensing legislation to animal care services, which could include dog training, walking and grooming services. Morris Golden. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Stealing a dog can affect the well-being of both the animal and owner, so it is not just a criminal justice matter, it is also an animal welfare issue. Unfortunately, the law currently regards stealing a dog as stealing an object. So does the Cabinet Secretary understand why myself, animal welfare organisations and others are calling for the welfare impact to be recognised in law? Cabinet Secretary. I do absolutely appreciate the points that the member has made in relation to this, and I know that this is an issue that he is, is very passionate about, as are others, because theft of a dog is a very serious matter, which I know can cause real anxiety and upset to owners. And it's only right that the criminal justice system is able to deal effectively with perpetrators of dog theft. Now, as the, the member alluded to, theft is a common law offence in Scotland with penalties up to life imprisonment available, and courts will take into account the circumstances of any theft when sent sentencing, including if that's a love family pet has been stolen. But dogs and other pets, are, of course, aren't the same as inanimate objects, and when a theft of a pet occurs, it can cause significant upset. I appreciate the work and the action that the member is looking to undertake in this regard, and I'd be more than happy to meet with him to discuss his proposals further. Thank you. I have four supplementaries. I want to take all of them, so uh, the plea again. Brief questions, brief answers. First, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am very favourable to Morris Golden's proposal. I hope he will reciprocate with mine. Cabinet Secretary is aware of my Welfare of Dogs Scotland Bill, which fell last session due to parliamentary pressure. Uh, that, of course, is to deter uh, prospective owners from purchasing online and from the horrible uh, puppy factory farms. Uh, can, I, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, without wishing to ambush her, if the Scottish Government will look favourably on my proposal, which I will launch shortly? Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate the Member's question because, uh, as she rightly states, I know that this is an issue that she has worked on for a long time, and I know that it's a matter that she's very passionate about, as are other members across the Chamber too. And uh, the Scottish Government does, of course, welcome any proposal that looks to improve animal welfare in Scotland. We will, of course, carefully consider the, the contents of Christine Graham's bill, and I really look forward to discussing in due course the measures that will be set out in it. Thank you. Uh, Colin Smith. Thank you, President. On the issue of animal welfare, why does the Cabinet Secretary think that hunting with a full pack of dogs is suddenly not cruel just because a hunt has a licence? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this is a matter that my colleague, the Minister for Environment and Land Reform, is working on. And as the, the member will know, there has been a consultation out on the proposals which will be brought forward in due course. But I'd be happy to have the Minister follow up with the member. Mark Ruskell. The Greyhound Board of Great Britain has finally released injury data from Greyhound Racing at Shawfield, revealing a doubling of injuries in 2020 compared to 2018. Given the growing evidence of the systematic abuse of greyhounds, including doping, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is time to explore all options for further regulation of this brutal industry? Cabinet Secretary. 
I, I would just say to the member that we currently do not have plans to ban the racing of greyhounds in Scotland, but of course we would consider any recommendations that the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission may make on greyhound welfare in due course. But I, I would also state that we consider that the provisions of the Animal Health and Welfare Act in Scotland 2006 as amended, are sufficient to ensure that action can be taken if the welfare of greyhounds, whether they are still racing or retired, is not being met. And the provisions of Part 2 of that Act apply to all people responsible for animals, including breeders, trainers and the owners of racing greyhounds. And what more can the Scottish Government do to ensure the safety of latchkey dogs, dogs which are able to escape from private gardens, and in some cases can be responsible for livestock worrying, which is of particular relevance in rural and island communities at this time of year. I think one point that I would highlight in that regard is in relation to microchipping, for, for example. So that's an effective method to identify animals and can, of course, help reunite dogs with owners uh, where a dog has been lost, where they've been stolen. And this government made it compulsory for all dogs to be microchipped and for contact details to be kept up to date. And that, of course, helps to ensure the swift return of lost dogs. And it is standard practice for enforcement agencies to scan all dogs coming into their care. But again, I'm more than happy to follow up with the member on the particular issues that she's raised today. Thank you. Question number two, Michelle Thompson. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the comments of NFU President Manette Batters, who stated that the UK Government is focused on anything other than domestic food production. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of domestic food production and particularly in these uncertain times. And we also recognise the huge challenges that are faced by our farmers and crofters in producing our food, given the rising costs due to supply issues and the overall impact of Brexit on the agricultural sector. Now, we therefore know how important maintaining support is for the industry. It provides vital stability, it provides certainty, and that's why we will not remove direct payments, and that's why we've also committed to maintaining basic payments at current levels for the duration of this Parliament. Now, that doesn't appear to be the Tories' approach in England, so I can understand the NFU President's frustration in that regard. And given how little George Eustace or any of the DEFRA ministers ever want to talk about food production or food security with me or any of the other devolved government ministers, I absolutely share that frustration. Michelle Thompson. I thank the Minister for that answer, and I know this SNP government has a strong commitment to active farming and food production. But given the recent comments of the Chief Executive of Scotland Food and Drink on the additional costs, complexity and risks which Brexit has put on the food and drinks business looking to do business with the EU, does the Minister share my concerns that small businesses may in effect give up their trade with the EU as a result of the additional red tape? Cabinet Secretary. I, I do share that concern and I think it is a very real concern because as a result of the UK's bad Brexit deal, Scottish food and drink businesses have to now comply with a whole range of, of non-tariff measures, whether that's export health certificates, the customs declarations, which can include, we know, burdensome paperwork and a range of additional and increased costs if they want to export to the EU. Now, the Scottish Government repeatedly warned the UK Government of the damage that would be caused by EU exit, um, which was astonishingly and recklessly pursued during the course of the pandemic. And some businesses are now struggling to export goods to existing customers in the EU, or they've completely lost that trade altogether. Now, these are the inevitable consequences of the UK Government's decision to take us out of the customs union and single market, and thereby agreeing to the imposition of third country treatment in customs and regulatory terms. And I think it's also important to remember that in the first nine months of last year, Scotland's food, and, uh, food exports to the EU fell by 10 per cent compared to the same period in 2019, so the impact of that couldn't be more stark. Supplementary, I call Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What we saw published yesterday in the vision uh, of the Scottish Government on the future of food production and farming was thin on detail. On page five, and I, I quote this, emissions from agriculture are still too high. We are not managing to do simple, obvious things. Blaming farmers for food production emissions is a cop-out. Even the Scotland Food and Drink Ambition 2030 only mentions climate change once. Cabinet Secretary, why has your government failed to do the obvious things, as you call them, like providing proper funding to farmers and a meaningful fleshed-out plan? Yep. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's a bit rich of the Scottish Tories to talk about proper funding when we are the government that's committed to maintaining funding for our farmers, committed to supporting food production and direct payments. And I really have to refute the first uh, uh, accusation that was made there about blaming farmers because that is absolutely not what we are doing here. Now, we recognise that emissions are too high and that's why we're supporting our farmers and crofters to lower their emissions and to do what they can to enhance biodiversity. That's part of the vision that we set out. It will also form part of the proposals that we 
we will bring forward as part of a future agricultural bill next year. And for the supplementary, Willie Rennie. It, we do need to apply more pressure to the UK Government to change its approach to the seasonal workers programme. It is having a devastating effect on farms in my constituency who have shrunk in the last year. Last year we had rotten fruit and veg in the fields. We would not even have the plants this year because we do not have the workers. What discussions has the Minister had with the UK Minister about this? And is she hopeful that they are going to change their approach? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, well, frustratingly, I think it is, well, first of all, a vitally important point that Willie Rennie has raised in that regard, but acutely aware of the concerns over the seasonal agricultural uh, workers scheme. And what was particularly frustrating about that is that the announcement on that was made on Christmas Eve with no warning or discussion with devolved administrations. And that is also a, a frustration that we have with the UK government. Now, this is something we have monthly meetings with the UK government and other devolved administrations to talk about uh, common issues. We have continued raised uh, the importance of migration. We have sought me meetings with the, the, uh, the Home Office ministers in an attempt to discuss that, but despite asking for that every single month, following that up with letters in between these meetings, we are yet to see that meeting take place, which is really frustrating and really disappointing when we are willing to work constructively with the UK Government to find solutions to these problems. We have also put forward a number of suggestions as to changes that could be made. I have also brought forward proposals for uh, rural visa pilots too. But unfortunately, you can only go so far when one partner is willing to engage in that discussion, but the other is unwilling to do so. But we continue to try. Thank you. Question number three has been withdrawn. Question number four, Eleanor Whittam. To ask the Scottish Government what supports they can provide to Scottish dairy farmers to promote sustainability and provide fairness in the supply chain. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is absolutely committed to supporting our dairy farmers to farm now and into the future. We have ensured that dairy farmers are able to access similar support to what they had under the Common Agricultural Policy before Brexit, such as the Basic Payment Scheme and Greening Payment. Sustainability is one of the key features of the Scottish Dairy Strategy, which was launched in February last year. We are also working on the introduction of mandatory written contracts within the dairy sector, providing more transparency and fairness uh, to the sector. I hope that more dairy farmers might also consider converting to organic and contributing to our plan to double the amount of agricultural land in organic. Production. Eleanor Whitton. The Cabinet Secretary for the answer, and she will be aware of the recent negative press which targeted the dairy industry as a whole. Does she agree with me that Scottish dairy farmers operate to some of the highest welfare standards due to the robust and comprehensive legal frameworks protecting animal welfare? And in recognising that many of our dairy farmers are losing or making very little money, that the value and provenance of milk is underestimated in the food supply chain. Can I ask the Cabinet Sec Secretary what consideration of supports can be given to dairy farmers to assist them working towards sustainable and regenerative farming, perhaps with an incentive to focus on school milk provision? Cabinet Secretary. I would just start off by saying that I absolutely agree with what the member has outlined there because I have visited a number of dairy farms and farmers in Scotland and I just do not recognise the recent portrayal of dairy farming as bearing any relationship to what happens here in Scotland. We have robust legislation to protect animal welfare and really to enable our farmers to operate to the highest standards, which they do. Now, we want to see our dairy sector thrive in the future through the Dairy Growth Board. Uh, domestic and international markets are scanned for those op looking to opportunities to increase uh, trade and retail opportunities and to supply our high quality milk into value added products such as cheese. But we also want to see more of our, our products in place in the public sector, such as in our schools. And I know that the member will be uh, acutely aware, and she's mentioned it before in this chamber, about the, the work that Moscale Organic Farm does and the role that they've played. And they now supply the whole of East Ayrshire and all the schools there too. That's more of what we want to see through our Food for Life programme. Um, but I, I could also just take the opportunity to commend Moscale Farm, since I've mentioned them there, in the work that they've done recently uh, in relation to the, to the war in UK. Ukraine. And the, they put out an appeal for collections. I happened to visit them on Monday uh, to, look at, to see the work that they're undertaking. And they've just done such a huge effort to try and help in, with the effort in Ukraine. And I really just want to take this opportunity to commend Bryce Cunningham and Mosgiel uh, Organic Farm for all the work that they've done and that they continue to do in supporting that effort. You're here. Uh, question number five, Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions the Rural Affairs Secretary has had with EU governments regarding the use of gene editing in agriculture. Cabinet Secretary. 
While there have been no recent discussions with EU governments regarding the use of gene editing in agriculture, I am aware that there is ongoing consideration at EU level on novel genomic techniques, including gene editing, and how these relate to existing GM legislation. The Scottish Government's policy is to stay aligned, we are practicable with the EU, and we are closely monitoring the EU's position on this issue. Liam Kerr. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Gene editing, which of course is not gene genetic modification, is backed by Scottish farmers and has been shown to have benefits for them, animals and consumers. But with trials now given the go-ahead in England, our farmers are in danger of being left behind commercially and competitively, as this government won't permit it in Scotland. Now, the NFUS has recently expressed support for trials in Scotland. Professor Whitelaw of the Rosalind Institute has come out as a strong advocate. So will the Cabinet Secretary listen to the experts, put aside any dogmatic adherence to EU rules and give trials of gene editing the green light in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I would say that, of course, we continue to listen. And as I've already said, Scotland's policy on GMOs hasn't changed. Now, we do remain opposed to the use of GM in farming to protect the clean green brand of Scotland's £15 billion food and drink industry. Now, we are absolutely aware of DEFLA's plans to review the, the English regulatory definitions of a genetically modified organism to exclude those organisms that have been produced by gene editing and other genetic technologies if they could have been developed by traditional breeding. Now, we are considering the implications for Scotland and will, of course, continue to engage with DEFRA, with the Welsh and Northern Irish governments to ensure that devolved competences are respected. And brief supplementary, Jenny Minto. Officer, as someone who eagerly desires to see Scotland become a good food nation and whose constituency is rich in some of the best produce you could hope to find anywhere, does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that we must engage with this subject very carefully to ensure that we do not undermine public confidence in the high standards of Scotland's agricultural sector and the quality of our produce? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I very much do, because as I previously mentioned, Scotland's policy on GMOs hasn't changed. And we know that DEFRA are clear that they want to make changes, and we have to ensure that whatever changes are made by, uh, by DEFRA and the UK government don't impact on Scotland. And we're in discussion with DEFRA to ensure that a GMO-free Scotland isn't compromised. Question number six, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government will it, whether it will provide an update on what discussions the Rural Affairs Secretary has had with the Land Reform Minister regarding the future funding of regional land use partnerships. Cabinet Secretary. I'm in regular discussion uh, with the Minister for the Environment and Land Reform on regional land use partnership pilots, which are funded from the net zero energy and transport portfolio budget. Now, these pilots are aiming to test approaches that facilitate collaboration at a regional level. They're looking to take a natural capital approach to maximising the contribution that our land managers make in addressing the climate and environmental crises. Now, we've provided some resource funding this financial year to support pilot establishment and will continue to fund them next year. And fund Funding from the pilots will inform decision making on future development and funding. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. RLUPs, including in DNG and the Scottish Borders, help national and local government communities and landowners and stakeholders work together to find ways to optimise land use in a fair and inclusive way, meeting objectives and supporting our net zero journey. So, can the Cabinet Minister provide any further information on how the pilot? Uh, projects have worked, and uh, the second part of my question is already an answered that future funding will continue. So, thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, last year, we announced that we would support five pilot uh, RLUPs to first establish themselves and then develop regional land use frameworks by the end of 2023. So the pilots are presently at too early a stage in their development to be fully assessed on that work. But should these pilots prove successful, successful we have committed in our programme for government to develop plans for a second phase as of next year. But what I can say is that the RLOPs, uh, as I previously intimated, are taking a natural capital-led approach to the development of the frameworks. Um, and I, again, we hope to have these in place next year and take forward further development from there. Okay. Question number seven, Stephen Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taken to ensure that farms are at the cutting edge of innovation and technology. Cabinet Secretary. Our vision for Scottish agriculture includes an undertaking to work with industry to improve business resilience, efficiency and productivity through greater deployment of innovation and technology. 
Through our strategic research programme, we offer in excess of £46 million each year to ensure that we remain at the cutting edge of innovation and technology. And additionally, we continue to deliver our commitment to develop ver vertical farming ambitions, support precision farming through the Sustainable Agricultural Capital Grant Scheme, and offer a test bed for innovation projects through the Knowledge, Transfer and Innovation Fund. Stephen Kerr. At the cutting edge, but apparently fairly ignorant of what gene editing is. I mean, it really is uh, despairing to think about what quality of advice the Cabinet Secretary must be getting on an issue as plain as the daylight in terms of the benefits that gen gene editing can bring. So can I ask, setting aside any SNP fetish there is about the EU, what assessment has the Minister made what assessment has the Minister made of the economic impact of continuing her ban on gene editing of crops? When was the last review undertaken? What did it conclude in terms of the effect this ban is having on Scottish farming's competitiveness internationally? And will she publish the advice she's receiving? Cabinet Secretary. As I've said in a previous response to another question, Scotland's policy on GMOs hasn't changed and it won't change because we remain opposed to the use of GM in farming because ultimately that protects the clean green brand of Scotland's £15 billion food and drink industry. And when it comes to gene editing, as I've already stated in the previous question that I'd had, that this is a situation that we are continuing to monitor and to follow closely. And supplementary, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. A highly innovative uh, uh, sector of um, agriculture is seed potato farming. I just would like to hear the Cabinet Secretary's response to the UK Government potentially striking a Canada-style deal, but recognising that it's still wholly inadequate in terms of repairing the damage that a hard Brexit has done to this highly valued part of Scotland's agricultural sector, not least in the North East. Margins of relevance, but Cabinet Secretary, briefly, please. <laughs> no, just to say, I mean, I absolutely share Gillian, uh, Gillian Martin's view on this, and particularly, this is something that is uh, particularly relevant for uh, our, our North East and the industry there. Now, I continue to be extremely disappointed by the UK government's lack of progress in this issue and in securing an equivalence agreement with the EU, because the loss of the EU and Northern Ireland markets it happened quite literally overnight, and it's been a significant blow to the sector. But to be clear, it is a direct result of the UK government choice to pursue a hard Brexit and the lack of commitment on dynamic alignment with the EU. And the Scottish Government has been, and we will continue to press the UK government to seek an urgent resolution to the EU decision. Thank you. Question number eight, Jackson Carlow, who joins us remotely. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how the 2022 regulations on the prohibition of fishing in the Firth of Clyde will impact on fishing businesses. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has continued seasonal Clyde's cod spawning closure for 2022 and 2023 from February to April without ex exemptions. However, the closure has been adjusted to make it more targeted and to make it more focused. We believe this measure will provide a higher chance of stock recovery and contribute to a more sustainable fishery in the west of Scotland. For 11 weeks, fishers are not allowed to fish in key spawning grounds for cod. This is crucial for the long-term sustainability of the, the stock, because despite the seasonal closure being in place since 2001, the stock has shown very little sign of recovery. Responsible fisheries management means ensuring that we get the right balance between socio-economic and environmental environmental outcomes. And in this case, we've done this by ensuring the right protections for spawning cod, while also ensuring that some fishing can continue to take place in surrounding areas. Jackson Carlow. Yeah, I hear what the Cabinet Secretary says, um, but I wonder if she too has heard Elaine White, who spoke powerfully yesterday on behalf of the Clyde Fishermen's Association at the Rural Affairs Committee. I mean, she made clear that the Firth of Cl uh, Clyde closures have left many fishermen with no other option now, really, frankly, than to find alternative work. And of course, that's really causing unbelievable stress. Many of them have had lifetime careers. But furthermore, she's concerned that this may actually lead to us having no fishermen in this area uh, and that the Clyde coast will end up being a forgotten coast in terms of fishing. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to listen to the industry uh, and also outline compensation plans to support those who've been affected by this peremptory enclosure, as well as perhaps giving a guarantee that she will consult with the industry in advance before taking such uh, important measures which have such a profound impact on the industry in future. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I would mean, just like to state that we are, of course, uh, committed to listening to industry, and that's part of the process that, that led to this. 
I, in light of the decision that was taken, where we took a pragmatic approach to protect uh, the, the exact areas where cod are spawning. And as a result of the scientific and pragmatic approach that we took, we ended up reducing the overall size of the area, uh, which I do think means that, of course, we have the protections in place while also enabling more fishing activity to continue. Now, in relation to uh, compensation, we, uh, in line with Scottish Government policy, we wouldn't be providing financial compensation for areas closed in order pr to protect fish spawning, such as those in the Firth of Clyde. And this approach is consistent with that, which has been taken in respect of similar management measures, including the National Cod Avoidance Plan and MPAs. Very, very brief supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise the Chamber how Firth of Clyde fishing businesses will ultimately benefit from an increase in the tonnage of fish they will be able to catch in future years through the conservation being introduced by the Scottish Government and indeed, could you touch on the benefits to the marine environment? Briefly, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, well, this closure is specifically aimed at protecting spawning cod to help them produce more eggs and hence larvae and eventually adult fish. So if they're not protected, they won't have the eggs to begin with and the biomass certainly wouldn't be improving. But introducing measures like this ultimately gives a higher chance of stock recovery for fish stocks on the West Coast. And it will help benefit those who make a direct living from the sea, onshore support businesses and the wider Clyde fishing community and an increase in availability of fish will also help reduce reliance on key shellfish species and open up opportunities for some businesses to diversify. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business.